Well, this time last year, um, I was in the process. Uh, me and my wife were in the process of moving our family across country to come be a part of Buckhead Church here. And um, man, it's been, yeah, thank you. you. You were clapping on the front row. You can't, the rest is too late. It's too late. But thank you so much to you. The rest of you, you're, you're, you're behind on that one. But we were transitioning across the country, and um, obviously, uh, our family was a big concern in that. We have four kids, and uh, for those of you who don't know, we have sort of two sets. We have two older kids and two younger kids. Uh, we call them the bigs and the littles. Our two olders last year were beginning eighth and ninth grade, so teenagers, and then kinder, kindergarten and second grade were our younger guys when we were, when we were moving here. And um, so we were, we were trying to figure out, like, you know, I, I knew for me, my wife's really good at this, I needed to step up and like be a bit more intentional in this season and with all the new stuff with moving and job and and all that that entails I knew it could be easy for us to not uh kind of focus on them. So we spent a lot of time specifically on our older kids because you know that's a that's a difficult time to move in life especially that big a move and um and so uh, we got into the year somewhere, and, and I, I just on me at one point, I was like, I think the little guys are doing good, but I don't really know. And so I'm riding in the car one day with Nixon, who's our youngest. He's six. And, and I just said, um, so Nixon, how are you feeling about living in Georgia and like moving here versus Arizona? And he goes, Dad, I love my childhood. <laughs> I was like, well, that's awesome, buddy. Like, tell me about that. Like, what do you love about your childhood? He's like, well... He's like, I got this new school and I have all these new friends. And I don't know if you know, there's a pack at school and I'm in the pack. And so like, I'm part of the pack. And like, he's like, and, and you know, we have a great house and my new room. I love my new room. And we have a great family and a great church. And, and he's like, he's like, I mean, who wouldn't want to be me? <laughs> Which I'm like, yeah, you have a pretty good life, buddy. I mean, yeah, like life's going really great. And then it was quiet for a second. And he said, Dad, can we go get milkshakes? <laughs> I was like, and there it is. And so I discovered in that moment, it, it, I, I've been accused of um, uh, parenting our older kids and grandparenting our younger kids. And this was a moment where I realized like, okay, that's really true. And I needed to turn around. It was clear who was in control of the relationship at that point. And so um, if you haven't, if you weren't with us last week, we're in a series called Navigating a Turnaround, and I clearly needed a turnaround in, in my parenting. I'm working on that, by the way. I'll give you an update later on. Um, but this series uh, is about what to do when things are headed in the wrong direction, whether it's in your marriage or in your career, in your personal life, whatever it is, in your family. Um, and we're diving deep into this ancient story, um, this story of Jonah. And if you weren't with us last week, this ancient story has like time-tested wisdom for turning around just about anything, regardless of what you're in the midst of. And some of you are thinking, no, no, you don't understand what I'm in the middle of. Well, today you're gonna be encouraged because Jonah finds himself in, in, a, in a, a tremendous predicament. As a matter of fact, I, I, to catch you up a little bit, last week uh, we talked about the genre of the story. And this is important to understand that the genre of this story was more like parable and um, you know, this is like what Jesus, when Jesus would tell a story in the New Testament, it wasn't like it wasn't true. He was telling a story uh, about someone or about a circumstance to, to teach a point. And that's the way this story is designed. As a matter of fact, the author primarily uses satire in the story, which is kind of like poking fun at or making fun of certain behavior to correct because particularly Jonah, who's the prophet in the story, he's not acting as he ought to. He's not doing what you'd expect the prophet would do. And he, he kind of uh, writes this like, like uh, in, in our modern day culture, it's sort of like SNL or Colbert. It's like, it, it's sort of trying to get uh, the people, the audience to correct their behavior and not be like Jonah. And, and the way this, the author structures this story is like a two act play. And we talked about this last week. And um, act one is chapter one and two, because there's four chapters in Jonah, chapter one and two. And act two is chapter three and chapter four. And each, each act has two scenes. So there's act one and act two, each have scene one and scene two. And there's incredible parallelism between these two. In, in chapter one and chapter three, scene one of each act, um, what we're gonna see, as we saw last week, what we're gonna see next week is the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. And then there's, he, there's some wrestling and there's this external conflict that he goes through. And then in chapters two and four, which are scene two of each act, uh, there's another parallel. And in this, uh, as we're gonna see today, in this scene of, of both acts, uh, Jonah's crying out to God and he's dealing with an internal conflict. 
And last week in, in Act 1, Scene 1, if you will, Chapter 1 of Jonah, Jonah sets out in the wrong direction. And we've, we've all heard the story. We know the story. He gets into a mess. There's a storm. And then in, in the, the literary technique shows this, as we illustrated last week, this downward spiral that Jonah goes on. And he creates chaos for people around him. And um, those people had no idea what was going on or why them, they were in the middle of a storm. And which often happens in life when people are behaving badly or not acting as they ought to and, and, and other people don't know. And, and, and usually the person who's acting poorly is not the one who's affected first. In fact, Jonah's actually blissfully sleeping below deck uh, in chapter one. And then Jonah gets woken up by the captain and by the crew. And, and, and the first step, which is sort of the first step, as we said last week, to turning around anything is opening our eyes to the reality of what's really going on. When you find yourself in a situation whether it's your fault or not, it, it, the first step to a turnaround is bringing to the surface as much as possible the reality of what's happening, opening our eyes and talking about and putting on the table the reality of the circumstances and situation. Last week, I gave an opportunity. If you didn't have somebody you could talk to or somebody you could do that with, uh, we wanted you to take a step just by praying. We had over 150 people text us saying, I'm in the midst of a turnaround situation and I need your prayers. And it's all sorts of, all manner of things. And if you didn't participate in that last week, I'm going to give you another opportunity uh, today. But today, uh, we're going to talk about Act 1, Scene 2. And I'm going to continue uh, sort of with this theatrical um, idea because I want us to remember uh, the, the, the literary techniques that are going on because it's, it's so helpful in understanding what's actually going on in the story. And as I said last week, for those of you who are concerned, I'm saying this isn't true. What I'm saying is, is it's more than true. This is a story that stood the test of time and it has deep meaning for what's going on in the world and in our lives. And this parable, it's like, it's like the condensed version of the, the most important parts of this story. And, and this fable or this parable is to, to teach us a point. And it's, it's written in this literary style that's incredibly rich. And this scene, the part today, not only includes the fish, which again, Sorry to you VeggieTale fans, is not the main character of the story, um, but it also contains the next step in a turnaround. After waking up, we discover what happens next. And um, also, as a part of today, uh, last week I opened with a story about a situation I found myself in uh, that was in need of a turnaround. And I got a bunch of uh, inquiries from people like, hey, what happened in that situation? And did things turn around? How'd you get things turned around? So I'm gonna come back to that and talk about that a little bit later uh, as well. Um, but we have to begin where we left off last week at, at the end of scene one. Uh, Jonah's thrown overboard and then then we're told, uh, now the Lord, and I, I held out on you, you didn't know this, but there's actually one verse left in chapter one at the end of scene one. And it's after Jonah gets thrown overboard, it says, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I just want you to imagine, this is where the curtain comes down on scene one. You know, we were on the boat and Jonah gets thrown overboard and a fish swallows him. And, and this is an interesting motif because this is actually a, a literary motif that if you, if, you, um, if you were a literary major or English major or something like English lit, you, you know this. This metaphor of being stuck in the belly of the beast is a, is a really old metaphor. But Jonah... Jonah and um, his, his fellow sailors, they were on this boat and this storm comes up. And, and again, I, I review this because these, these are important details in the story. So they're on this boat and I, I did a better job drawing this the first service, so I, forgive me for that. But they're, they're on this boat and, and they're, the seas are, are, are raising, the, the, you know, the rain's coming down, the, the wind's blowing, like there's all sorts. And they, they launched Jonah overboard. So he goes overboard into, into the water, splash, uh, into the water, and then he's sinking down into the water. And we find out, in, and this is my little bit of a, a, a nod to VeggieTales because I've beat up on VeggieTales enough, and, and VeggieTales does really great work, and they're trying to do something awesome. But the point is, is the fish probably didn't look like this, um, but uh, the truth is, is um, a huge fish, and you know, again, metaphorically, this is like, this monster in the deep that comes out and, and it, it swallows Jonah whole, which this motif, by the way, which whether you realize it or not, um, 
and he's, you know, he's got a little spout right here. You know, we got, we got, we got to make sure we have all the details in here. But he, whether you know this or not, this this motif of being in the belly of the beast is one of the most famous and most often uh, repeated story motifs in in all of literature. Which, which is ironic, just as an aside, that people often try to discredit the scriptures because of this story. They say, well, there's no way that could happen. And it's like, and then we repeated the same motif over and over and over. And this is one of the, this is one of the earliest stories that we know of that has this motif in it. It was, it was literally copied by Pinocchio with Geppetto in, in the belly of the whale. Um, but it's also the central idea in The Lion King and in Star Wars and Gladiator and Harry Potter, and and I could go on and on and on. It's this somebody stuck in this really difficult, really hard situation. It's like, how are they gonna get out of this? Like, can you escape this? Can you get out of this? And here's the thing, if it didn't resonate or it wasn't relatable or it wasn't true to the human experience, I mean, it would have never survived, much less been repeated over and over and over throughout literary history. And so, so Jonah's trapped in the belly of the beast and he, he's in this, this beast, and it sort of represents, I guess, for today, like if you think about this, it, for us, it, 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 the audience, it represents being stuck in circumstances or in a season of hardship or brokenness or pain or difficulty. When you're wondering, like, how did I get here and how am I ever going to get out of here? And if you're a Jesus follower in the midst of a season like this or circumstances like this, you wonder to yourself, like, is this some sort of punishment of some kind? Or, or is there purpose for why I'm going through what I'm going through and why I'm experiencing this? Is, is this a result of something I've done? Or is this something that someone else did that's caused me to be in this situation? Or is this something that God is doing? And how long will it last? And how the heck do you get out of this? I mean, will I ever be able to escape this? And so this is the beginning of Act 1, Scene 2, or Jonah Chapter 2. And here's the wild thing is the curtain went down. We were on the boat. Curtain goes down uh, at the end of Chapter 1, at the end of Scene 1. And the curtain comes up on Scene 2, and we're in a different setting. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And so just to play along here, I want you to imagine this, the, the curtain comes up, and we're in a dark place. And I don't know what, what it would look like if we were actually watching this in a play, but we're in a, a darkness. The, the whole set changed. And um, Jonah's in the belly of the fish, and he's praying out to God. And what follows this is a, a brilliantly crafted poetic prayer from the belly of a fish. You see the satire? It's like, I mean, you read it and you go, okay, that probably isn't the way it happened in the belly of the fish. So this story is being told in such a way that Jonah's crying out to God and Jonah learns some things in this situation. And as a matter of fact, as, as his prayer is repeated, and, and I, I'm gonna do a little bit of work here for us, but, but there's, there's four things, sort of four quadrants. And, then there, and the reality is, is, is there's four couplets in this prayer. And it's this theme that repeats of things related to Jonah are still going down and things related to God and his interaction with God. I mean, remember, this is an inner struggle. This isn't an external struggle. It's an inner struggle in him as he's wrestling with God. Um, things are still going down for Jonah and there's this upward motif with, with God. And each of these couplets provides some unique insight regarding his experience. And it's written in such a way that we're meant to take away some things from this. As a matter of fact, it's meant to be a set of glasses through which we view our own struggles and our own circumstances and our own difficulties. So this is how it begins. He said, in my distress, I called on the Lord and he answered me. From deep, listen to this language, from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. Jonah's in deep in the midst of circumstances that he would say, take most people out. There are things that most people don't come back from. He describes it from being in the realm of the dead. And in the realm of the dead, he cries out to God. Sound familiar? You're in a situation where it's like, I don't know what else to do. I've done everything I know to do. So I'm gonna cry out to God. And, and this is where you and I can relate. He's done something that he 
Uh, and, and this has happened many times in my life. He, he doesn't do what he ought to do or he thinks he has a better way or I know better for my life. I know what the scripture says. I know what God says, but like, I, I think I, I know a better way. That's really old literature and I know what's, what's right for me. And so I'm gonna go my way. I'm gonna do my thing. I don't wanna go to the rocky hills of Northern Iraq. I wanna go to the beach in Spain, duh, don't we all? So it's like, that's where he's headed. And and when he creates a mess for himself and others, then he cries out to God to save him after he's created the mess, which I can relate to. I know none of you have ever done that in your life, but like he cries out to God, like, help me and wait for it. And you listen to my cry. God listens to him in the midst of the depths of all the, like at the bottom, in the belly of the beast, in the worst possible situation, he's kind of behaved his way into, he cries out to God. And here's what I think Jonah would say. Jonah's learning from this. Is, <clears throat> I believe Jonah would say, look, here's what I discovered. Even when you find yourself in that place, you're never, you're never too far. You're never too far away from God that if you cry out to him, he won't hear your voice. You're never too far, regardless of what you've done or where you've been or what you've been up to, where you were last night. You're never too far away to call on God because when you do, he will hear you. He goes to the next couplet of this going down versus going up. He, and this is interesting. It's, it's sort of like, it's the same thing over again. So it was, he was going down and he cried out up to God. And now it's, you hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea. So Jonah's going down and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers, they swept over me. It's like he's being overwhelmed by this stuff. It's taking him over. But I, I, I immediately go, time out, wait a minute. Like, we read in chapter one that the sailors threw him into the ocean, but that's not Jonah's perspective. Jonah here is, he's acknowledging God's involvement and God's authority in these circumstances. So the question's like, so did, so did God do this? Or did Jonah do this? Like, did, is this a result of God's activity or is this a re result of Jonah's behavior? And, and as the answer usually is, the answer is yes. It's both. And God is working in the midst of Jonah's behavior, even though it's not what God wanted him to do. And at first for Jonah, it felt like punishment for not aligning with God's direction. Look what he says. He continues. He says, I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. This, this word banished is like an abandonment. He's saying, I thought you abandoned me. I thought you cast me out when, when you brought the storm and you launched me into the, to the, you, you launched me into the abyss and, and, and the waters came over my head and the huge fish, it consumed me. I, I, I thought you'd abandoned me. But then Jonah's like having this head slap moment. It's like, but I realized like there's something about my, the consequences of my situation that, that are not about you abandoning me. It's not, it's not like we think about that as punishment when, when there's, there's consequences. But Jonah's saying, look, here's what I discovered. I discovered that the, the consequences were about me being corrected, not rejected. This was about you correcting me and leading me in a different direction, bringing correction in my life, not rejection in my life. You were trying to help me to turn things around and lead me in another direction. And yes, my behavior was part of that. But you also brought some natural consequences, which isn't it true? Like some behavior in our lives have natural consequences. Like you do certain things and there's consequences and you realize like, okay, that was my doing. And, and, and they're natural. Like when you're, when, when, if you have kids or when you were a kid, you, you didn't have to be taught um, to touch the fire, not to touch the fire more than once, right? Like you touch it and, and like there were natural consequences. It burned. So you're like, oh, I'm not gonna touch that because it burns. But there are other things that don't have natural consequences or at least immediate consequences like lying or disobeying or things like that. And uh, when our oldest was, was young, we were one of those naive parents. We we're like, we're not baby proofing our house. Like we're not doing anything like that. We're not lifting things up. We're not gonna get it out of the reach of children. It was like, I was like, we got electronics and they're low. And I realized there's like lots of lights and knobs and it looks enticing, but we're gonna teach our kids not to touch that stuff. And so um, my son, uh, my oldest, um, he'll be in therapy one day, but when he, when he, 
when, because we, we tried everything out on him. So he, he's, trying to, he's trying to touch the electronics with the TV and, the, and the, the radio and the stereo system and all that surround sound system because it looks enticing. And so, you know, when he was touching it, like I went over, I was like, I got to teach him not to touch that stuff. So I go over, I pop him on the hand. Don't judge me. I pop him on the hand. And I'm like, you know, like, you're not allowed to touch that. And, I, and he tries to touch it again. I pop on the hand. I'm like, no, 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 no. And you do this a few times. And then one day, my wife and I were in the kitchen. We saw him crawl over to the stuff like he was going to touch it. I was like, just watch him. He goes over, and he's about to touch it. And he goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, perfect. I'm brilliant. It works. Like, a consequence is needed. And, and the point is, like, this is, this is what God does in his kindness. Like this is Jonah saying, I thought I knew the direction I wanted to go or the direction I should go or the direction I needed to go, but clearly my competency for navigating my own life is severely lacking. And God brought some consequences, not because he's rejecting me, not because he's casting me out, but because he's trying to correct me. Maybe looking back up to him will help me navigate this disaster I found myself in. Which leads us to the third couplet. In the engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. I love this part. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. This feels like the most hopeless and the most desperate. And I love this. This seaweed turban part is like super interesting. Like he's in the water and it's enveloped him. It's all around him. And in the ancient world, um, the water represented the consciousness. And, and going deep into the consciousness is like going into the subconscious, into things that are sort of repressed, things that you have to really press into to explore those things meant to go deep into the inner world, into your inner psyche, into your inner self to understand. And the deeper you go, like in the water metaphor, is like the darker things get, which by the way, just side note, is my greatest fear in life, deep, dark water. I mean, anybody else with me? Okay, maybe you're not terrified yet. I just want you to imagine being on the back of a cruise ship at night, falling off and being in the middle of the ocean, watching the cruise ship sail away while nobody knows you're in the water. Terrified? I mean, it's, that's like the most terrifying thing. You can't see what's underneath you. You know there's monsters down there, which, which by the way, this is like a great disservice. If you're a new parent, I wanna help you. Um, so kids aren't afraid when they're young. We tell them there's no monsters in the dark. That's not true. <laughs> that's just not true. Like maybe there aren't any under the bed or in the closet at the moment, but all the monsters are in the dark. Like that's how we've survived as a people. That's why you're, that's why you're supposed to come home when the street lights come on. Remember that? Or, or your, your mom told you nothing good happens after dark. I mean, the worst crimes take place at night. Like this is it's not typically in broad daylight do, do things like that happen. And whether you know this or not, if, if you're a science person, you'll love this. Like, did you know that we're biologically predisposed to fear the dark? Like it's, it's been hardwired into us neuro, neurologically over thousands of years. Like if you strayed too far from the fire, like our ancestors, like you got picked off by a predator or, or by a monster. And this is, this is symbolic here. Like the, the writer of Jonah is using this story to say, look, I get it. When you go try to explore the parts of you that you've been avoiding or suppressing or trying to forget or cover up and hide, it's scary. It feels like they've barred you in forever, like, like you're never going to escape it because these things plague you over and over. It, it, it's going back to last week, it, it's not simply that you're not doing what you ought to do because just, just trying to do what you ought to do is behavior modification. That's not gonna fix anything. The, the question is why? Why aren't you doing what you ought to do? That's a, that's a different animal. That's a different monster, if you will, that you have to face. It's often deep down inside. It's in, it's in darkness that needs to be pulled out. And you can't conquer those demons from your past or the difficulties or the mistakes if you're not willing to face them. You know this. You've heard this. And so here's Jonah going like, this barred me and I did not think I could get out of this. But God, but you, Lord my God, you brought my life up from the pit and this, this term, this Hebrew term, the pit, this was actually a name. It was a proper name for, for something that they used to describe a trap that they would catch lions in. 
So, so what, what Jonah's saying is like, look, even though I fell into this trap, you rest me, rescued me out of this trap I fell into. And it's the same trap I've fallen into over and over and over, which interestingly enough, that's, that's the way it works, right? You, you, you repeat the same mistakes. You, you, you fall into the same things over and over. Spoiler alert for next week, Jonah does the same thing. He falls into the same pattern again. And it, it reminds me when I was a kid, I probably don't have time for this, but when I was a kid, um, we used to go to the Thousand Islands. It's not just a salad dressing. We used to go to a place called the Thousand Islands. Literally, there's thousands of islands, go figure. And um, we used to stay, our friends owned an island, which how cool is that? And so we used to go there in the summer uh, for vacation. And, and one of the things we love to do is, is fish. You can fish right off the island. There's tons of fish. And I didn't know, we were young and we, we didn't know that like catching little bluegill and stuff, like that, that there was a lot better fish to be fishing for, but we just like pulling them out of the water. And so at one point we realized like these, these little fish in the boathouse, they're really easy to catch. And so you put a worm on there and like you throw your hook in and in seconds you're pulling a fish out, which as a kid, if you're pulling a fish out of the water, you're catching, you're not fishing. So this is awesome. Like you're, so we're, we're having a competition. Me, my older brother, uh, he's 18 months older. My younger sister's four years younger. And all of a sudden my sister, like every two seconds pulling a fish out. And my dad's like taking him off the hook and she back in catching the fish. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm not taking time to put a worm on. He's like, they'll just jump on the hook. <laughs> like what? I walk over there. I'm like, I wanted to yell into the water. It's a hook. But this is what we do, right? We get hooked by the same things, hooked on the same things over and over and over. And, and you gotta at some point back up and go, why am I doing this? And, and it's like, if, if I think, if I could extrapolate what I think Jonah's saying is, look, you have to go deeper. You have to, you can't just change the behavior because as you go deeper, you'll become freer. That's how you get rescued. That's how God rescues you out of the pit is when you go deep enough to discover why am I falling into this trap? Just when you think you're barred in and you're never, you're gonna be in this prison you can't get out of, God lifts you out of that trap. And then the last couplet, when my life was ebbing away. This is after the most intense part of what he, he's experienced. Now it's like the light's going out. Like this is the most difficult moment where it feels like all hope is lost when my life was ebbing away. I remembered. I remembered you, Lord. And my prayers rose to you, to your holy temple. Hey, he's calling out again. And, and this, this, this idea of remembering was a, was a really profound theme in the prophets. Just when I thought my life was slipping away and I was never gonna recover from this, I remembered, and to remember, think about this, to remember is to shift your focus. You're thinking about and focused on one thing, and then you remember something else, and it shifts your mind from this thing to this thing, and what he remembered was the Lord his God and what he was capable of, and he shifted his mind to from the thing that was overwhelming him. As he was ebbing away, he was overwhelmed. He shifted his mind from the thing that was overwhelming him to the one that could help him overcome. That this, is, this shift is, is a shift to the one who could overcome all of the problems, the, whole, the one that would eventually overcome the whole world. And this, this shift in focus, it was a shift from um, the thing that overwhelms to a place where he could overcome. He could overcome versus being overwhelmed, which is, which we, when you think about it, is what happens. You know, those of you who've, who've done this and, and you've worked through therapy, you know, when you, the mind is a powerful thing. When you shift your mind to something or someone that you know that, that can help you lift, lift you out of the pit or rescue you, like you, you, you stop being as overwhelmed as you were before. And you begin to believe that you can be overcome. And, and this shift in focus was ultimately a shift in trust for Jonah. And, and this is what he says about that. He said, the, those who cling to worthless idols, which is what he used to trust in, what he used to be focused on, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. He's saying like, I used to trust in something else to kind of control my life, which was the nature of idols in, the, in, the, in this, this time period. They actually created idols. Think about this. They created idols that were things that they constructed. They were man-made man idols. And then they protected these images and they would sacrifice to these image, images to try to manipulate them into getting what they wanted. 
So they would use stuff. They would use stuff in their life to try to make them happy and to control their life and to pursue and get out of life what they thought they wanted out of life, which is what Jonah was doing. And Jonah said, you know, well, those things that I was clinging to that I took hold of, they took hold of me and they led me away from God's love, God's best for me. But, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you instead. I'm gonna look to you and I'm gonna sacrifice to you, God. What I have vowed, I will make good, which is what we do, right? We promise God, like, hey, I'll, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again, right? Hey, but I'll never do it again. I'll make good on what I promise. And I will say, salvation comes from the Lord, which you look at that and you go, what a turnaround. But here's what's so interesting. Jonah has this turnaround, but, but look where he is all along the way. He's still in the belly of the beast and he's claiming salvation, which isn't exactly the belly, so forgive the drawing, but you get the idea. He's still in, in, in the belly of the beast. He's still in the midst of these dark circumstances. And what's interesting is his circumstances haven't changed, but he's found salvation. He's found gratitude. And here's why I think that is. I think it's because the beast or the fish wasn't what he needed rescued from. And th this is how I know this. You have to remember what happened in scene one. At the end of scene one, it's why I began with this. As we started scene two, you know, you, you, the play was last week, so you, you need to get caught up. But the beginning, the, the end of chapter one says this. It says, now the Lord provided a huge fish. He provided the huge fish that swallowed Jonah. Oftentimes we wonder why God prevents certain things and why he permits other things. And I think Jonah's saying, I don't know why he, he prevented, uh, you know, me from, he didn't prevent me from going in this situation and why he permitted all this bad stuff to happen. But here's what I know. I know the Lord provided this huge fish, this place for me to be swallowed. He, he provided an environment for me that would help me grow and that would help me level up in life to become who I ought to be. Uh, last week, I, I told you about a situation where I was in some circumstances where they were way over my head and, and, and many of them weren't my doing when I first got there. The, um, I was leading a church and this organization was in a free fall and um, we were losing thirty to $40,000 a month and we were four or five months from not making payroll and, and like really difficult things. And I was, I was struggling. And this is, this is uh, almost two years in, a year and a half in. And I was dealing with significant turmoil. Things are still not going well. And, and in fact, um, on my nine mile drive from the church to my house, there were times, and I'm not proud to say this, but there were times I'd be riding in my car and I'd say, okay, God, if this is what it is to follow you, I don't think I want to. Like, not just in these circumstances, but like in life. Like, I thought we were taking a step and we were doing what you wanted us to do. And now we're here and I'm a year and a half or almost two years in and, and things are still going terribly. Like, in, in this, these circumstances that I'm in. And, and this inner turmoil that I was dealing with was spilling over um, to people around me, to people I worked with in my own home. And fortunately, I had some people who recognized this and recognized there were difficult things going on and began to ask me some hard questions. And it led me to sort of reach out to some other people and talk to a counselor about what maybe was going on inside of me. And I began to discover that um, a lot of this was driven by uh, my own insecurity. And, and I had this fear, like, and I was being driven by this fear. And I was operating, I wasn't allowing God to work in my life. I was, I was trying to handle these circumstances by myself. I was trying to do it my own way. I was trying to figure it out my own way. And yes, we had taken a step of obedience, but only to get there. Since I got there, it was like, no, no, I can figure this out. I can handle this. I can do this on my own. And when things weren't turning around, I was rescuing or wrestling with what happens if this thing fails? Like, if I'm really, really honest, like, there were days I thought, like, if we have to put a for sale sign out front, like, because the church is failing, um, if the church doesn't make it, I don't think I can make it. I wasn't sure I could be okay. And I had to wrestle through that. I had to wrestle through the fact that I was finding my identity in what I do. 
instead of who I am. And, and I was wrestling with like what this would say about me and what this would mean about me. And I realized this, a lot of this was about me. And I'd been shielding people in the church from like what had been really going on and because I didn't want to tell them. And I wasn't lying, but it was one of those things where it was like, you know, I, I wanted to focus on the good news and the positive, hoping things would turn around. And so me and the board behind the scenes were navigating all the difficulties of the finances and all the, all the difficult things. And then I, I, called, I called Andy one day. I'm going to include this part of the story. I called Andy and I just said, hey, listen, um, I need your help. I need you to talk me out of something. I had this idea and it's a terrible idea. And I don't know what a good leader would do. You've always told me, think about what a good leader would do. Ask yourself that question. I don't know, so that's why I'm calling you. But I'm pretty sure this is a terrible idea and I need you to talk me out of it. And he said, okay, what's the idea? And I said, I think I'm gonna, on Sunday, I just wanna just like go tell the church everything that's going on. It's back to school weekend. It's supposed to be, you know, other than Christmas and Easter, this is like a big weekend in church. And it's like, everybody's coming back and new people show up. And like, this is a big, big uh, weekend at the church. And, and I was like, I was like, I just feel like I just, this week, it was a Tuesday. I was like, I, I just think I just need to tell everybody. But that's a terrible idea. Like, save me. What should I do? He's like, I think that's exactly what you should do. I was like, well, that's not helpful. I need to call somebody else because that's, <laughs> yeah, I think this is a terrible idea. And he's like, no, that's exactly what you should do. He's like, I don't, I've never been in a situation like that, but I, I think... I think that's important. And so literally, I, I didn't have a fancy chalkboard then. I, I, at that time, I was using a, a flip chart. And on the flip chart, I literally started the message. This is no lie. It was, I was terrified. It was, it was like, hey, before I got here, I can't really like comment on what happened. Like that didn't have anything to do with me. And I know there were things that come, caused things to go downward, but I've been here almost two years, year and a half, almost two years. And here's what's happened since I got here. And I'll tell you, um, I never been more terrified about how people would respond. And I just said, hey, look, here, here's what's happening. Like, and I laid it all out and I just explained to them, well, you know, how things were going down and why they were going down. And I, and I just told them, I said, like, humbly, like, I, I've never done this before and I don't, I don't know what to do and, and I need your help. And I, I realized that, like, I was centered around me and what I thought and me trying to figure out how to do this and what it would say about me if I couldn't. And I realized this was your church before it was my church. And I need your help. I don't know how to fix it. There are some good things happening, but I need you to lean in. And I saw people that for, for weeks and months had sat there with their arms crossed. I saw their arms come down and then start to lean forward. And I just said, look, um, we need to do this together and I, and I need your help. And it was terrifying for me to uncover that. It, it felt like being in the belly of the beast. And I thought, there's no way out of this. Like after this day, I'm not going to have a job. And I have four kids. I have a family. I got to support them. What am I going to do? So I ended the sermon and I, I told them some things they could do to help. And, and I prayed. I'll never forget this as long as I live. I finished praying. And I opened my eyes and I started walking off the stage and everybody in the room stood and clapped. Here's why this was so impactful is because that's not what you expect when you bear your soul and you tell people like, hey, here's what's going on inside of me. Here's what's really happening. And I think for the first time, the church was like, oh, we'll trust you now. We trust that guy. Like, I, I wanna lean in. I wanna help you. I wanna lean towards you. Here, here's the deal. Some of you today, you're, you're in a dark place and, 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 and you're in a dark place. Here's the thing. Sometimes it, it can be terrifying. You think nobody's gonna lean in, but sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but you've really been planted. See, often what terrifies you most, the, the owning up or, or the uh, uncovering something or going to counseling or going to rehab or some residential treatment center or, or whatever it is, is, is actually something that the Lord has provided. It feels like it swallowed you up, but it's something the Lord has provided as a vehicle for your growth and your transformation, for you to level up, for you to grow, for you to become all that he desires for you to be. And at just the right time when his work is completed, if you'll humble yourself and look up, he will deliver you out of the belly of the beast just like he did Jonah. Verse 10, last verse of the chapter says, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah. I know that's disgusting, but it threw him up onto dry land. 
Look, as we conclude today, look, the first step was to wake up, to own up to, 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 to reality, what's really going on. Step two is diving deep. You, you have to do this. Like this is, this is part of the work. It's, it's part of what's necessitated in a turnaround. You have to explore why. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why is what's happening happening? And being willing to go, I realize part of this might be me. Like maybe there was already problems here, but maybe I'm perpetuating them. Maybe I'm contributing to them. Maybe I'm enabling them. There's a reason why you're headed in the wrong direction and things aren't going well. The same as there was Jonah. And you owe it to yourself and to those around you to discover why. That, that's necessity to finding your way out. And, and you should also, second, you should consider asking for help. You may have people around you or you may at times need someone who's skilled with doing inner work in your life to lead you to explore the, the darkest parts of you, the things that maybe you don't even remember that have happened to you or that you've done. Now, not everybody needs counseling, but I'll just tell you, many do. My wife, Jen, and I, both in different seasons uh, in our lives, we've needed that to, to understand what's happening on the inside of us. Now, I'll just tell you, you shouldn't just see anyone. There's a lot of bad counselors out there. I mean, no offense to any of them, but you should get a, a referral for a trusted counselor. And, 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 and at your church um, or at this church, someone's gonna come up at the end of the service and, and tell you um, what you can do at your local church and what resources they have available. But here's the other thing I would say, if you're not ready to explore why, and you're not considering, you're ready to consider asking for help, would you at least let us pray for you? If, if that's you, it's not too late. You can still text turnaround to 51255. And there's a army of prayer warriors that love interceding for people. And we would love to pray for you put you on our prayer list and we're not gonna badger you. We're not gonna make you do anything you don't wanna do. You can stay anonymous. We just wanna pray for you and ask that God would turn things around. He would help you understand and that you would, with wisdom, decipher how to turn things around. See, when you're ready to face the things that are holding you back, that are leading you in the wrong direction, the things you're terrified will take you out. Here's what I want you to remember. You're never too far. No, no matter how far away you think you are, how bad you think things are, you're never too far. The consequences of what you're experiencing are God's correction, not his rejection. The deeper you go in exploring why you are where you are, the freer you'll become. And what seems overwhelming, it's already been overcome. 700 years later, Jesus would show up. He would quote and affirm the story of Jonah and say, hey, one even greater has, has come. And he confirmed all the things Jonah said. And he said, look, I don't even, I don't need rescuing. But through his own death and resurrection, he proved his power to rescue. And he validated Jonah's declaration that salvation comes from the Lord. Let me pray for you. God, I pray for somebody who's here today who maybe is a friend of somebody or maybe it's they themselves are in a situation that, that's difficult. They're not sure why what's, what's going on is going on. Maybe it's not even a full-blown mess. Maybe they don't feel like they're in the belly of the beast yet. I pray that you would give them the wisdom to realize that it's never too early and it's never too late to look up, to cry out to you. That the consequences and the difficulty is not you abandoning them, it's you trying to steer them back and correct them back. Or maybe you want to use them to try to steer somebody else and correct somebody else back. God, I pray that you would give somebody courage today to take a step to ask for help, to be willing to do the hard, the deeper work that leads to maximum freedom from those traps that, that catch us over and over and over. And then God, today, I pray that somebody who's in the midst of circumstances that, that seem overwhelming, they seem like it's a prison they'll never get out of, that you would help them to recognize that there is one who's overcome. In fact, he's overcome the whole world. And that they would look up and they would choose to shift their focus. They would remember there's a God who sent his son who gave his life for them and that they would look up and they would recognize the truth of what it looks like to trust you and how you'll raise them up out of the pit. 
We pray it in Jesus' name.